cascade down on top of each other. And as it went through there, spinning, I think it spin, spun to the right, it would break those rocks. Inside that, you also have little retainer rings that are about a half inch up off the, the top of that scrubber. So that it had full time to really scrub those rocks and so no gold stuck, stuck in the mud. <coughs> this one went the other direction. I'd never seen that. Uh, nobody ever put it together except for that one guy. That this screening section was all done in punch plate and it was in, you could see, slightly curved so that as it rolled over, it would go to this flat plate. And the gold and, and uh, pay gravel ran out in this short sluice. The oversized went up to the top and they stirred it with a cap. <clears throat> um, that helps you if you don't have the ability to move that conveyor. And if you have somebody on your crew that's really stupid, you can keep them entertained for hours, pushing rocks up on the end of that, as long as you don't get them to drive off the end. I've seen that a couple of times. It gets way too damn exciting. Uh, we ended up in a big government meeting <coughs> with five or six agencies because he was so successful that the gravel, that he, the first eight foot was running $50 a yard. But when he got through the gravel and got into bedrock, it was really a load deposit, but it was altered so heavily that it was still running $9 a yard, and his operating costs were only three bucks. So he just kept going down. And <clears throat> this dam was almost 175 feet high. And in Montana, if you have a dam higher than eight feet, you have to go to the Dam Safety Bureau. And so there was <clears throat> all of us and all the agencies discussing what do you do with a 100 foot high, 150 foot high dam that doesn't have any water behind it, it's just solids. And it took quite a bit of negotiations on that one. But back to the system <coughs> of having that ability to have a scrubber back here, that's your conditioning unit, and then a screening device in, in rotating in order to get the gold recovered, one man operation. <coughs> This one was a little bit more of a challenge. Um, still here, over by Anaconda, it's a scar deposit, has a substantial amount, as in a lot of scars, with magnetite. I mean, lots of magnetite. And so consequently, they would mine it, haul it up here to the top, vibrating screen deck. This had come down, <coughs> going through all this stuff, end up, these are magnetite separating. Uh, magnetite separation drums. And so you end up with two ruffers and then there was a cleaner. These had come down below and the material would then go over to a Wilfley table on this side. And the oversize would come out here. And it was a good idea. I mean, we were talking magnetite that was, oh, probably six to 10 ton a day on a, on a really easy basis. And <clears throat> the only thing was, they didn't test it, they didn't know what size the gold was, they didn't know where it was located, um, and a common thing in a lot of these is you don't need to know much about gold, just run more of it. And so if you can get it up to <clears throat> oh, two or three thousand yards an hour, uh, you can make money. You don't have gold, you don't have gold. There's a damn thing you can do about it. So I ended up going up there and it was in multiple layers from different deposits. And I panned channels down through each one and discovered all the gold was in the bottom one and there wasn't any gold above that and they needed to just strip it out. And I explained to them, process this, throw that, and they told me, you don't know anything about what you're doing, and they went bankrupt in about four months. <coughs> and that, that second thing you learn, if you're a consultant, I wasn't, I was in government, and I was there because I was there to help. Uh, they never believed me. If <coughs> you are a consultant and you charge $20 an hour, you're cheap, you don't know anything. If you charge $90 an hour, <coughs> 
you're a nice guy, but you're just learning. And this last year, I changed my price to $125 an hour. I've never had so much work in my life, and I really just wanted to retire. I, I can't explain it. it. It doesn't make any damn sense at all. <clears throat> but, like I said, magnetic drum separators, you know, one of the only places I'd seen them, and then <clears throat> and up in here was, was just a vibrating screen deck. Back to that point, if you, if you have clay, you're going to have to use a scrubber. If it's dry, you can run it through a screen deck. But you need to do pick, you know, let the deposit tell what it is that you're actually running it with. And this is the Courtney deposit. <coughs> this was the Sapphire operation, it was uh, over by Deer Lodge. And <coughs> they would dig the entire pile, everything that was in it dig it out, put it in the ground. Part of that was because it allowed it to, to slack. And when they feed it back through the vibrating uh, screen deck, then it would go up here to this vibrating screen deck. And at that point, it not only sized it out, <coughs> but the underflow then came out the bottom and that was in a, in a gold sluice. And so <coughs> they, like I said, came out of the hole went up here, went back through this, come off the end, went back in the hole. This pile was all sapphire bearing gravel. And so <clears throat> what they're doing is conditioning that material. They're screening it, sizing it, uh, get everything to the point, pull out what little gold there was. This was the most interesting one. And in you get to work with gold, you learn about fineness. The fineness on this gold was 350 meaning that it was mostly silver. And so I, I watched the guys and they, they got piles of gold on the table. And I said, what is that? And they said, oh, it's gold. And I said, why do you just have it there? And he says, at a finest of only 35% gold at that time, I think silver was six bucks. It wasn't worth their time. So they picked it and kept it in a, in a bunch of the <clears throat> So then, once they got that, and you'll, you'll notice the culprit right there. This was a mint class. Skinny. <laughs> and they would bring the, that concentrate that was just uh, dirt and sapphire sized to about a half inch and run it up on the top. Now, one of the key points that I learned over the years is if you've ever sat and monitored a pump, pump surge, so that they will, <clears throat> there'll be a high flow and a low flow, but it'll surge all that time. If you can feed, this is a constant hit feed, makes all the difference in your jigs. <clears throat> because you pump the water up uh, through the, the bottom of this, and that's annoying. And see, this, this is your overflow. So you keep it slightly overflowing, but this makes sure that you have a constant head of the water that's coming into that jig. And <clears throat> I'd worked with them for quite a while, and we, there was a, a number of places that you could get uh, little round uh, balls that were set up to the exact specific gravity of sapphires so that the sapphires would go right into that bed and it was only about two inches thick. You have screens on that. The underflow then comes out underneath that. You've already pulled out the fine gold. This was all sized at about, oh, I think three eighths to a half inch. And the underflow had already gone up for the gold. So run this stuff through, <clears throat> and on Friday night we're there, and they jump up and they had uh, one set of jigs in the front and a follow-up on the back side that was, front ones were here, this one here. Now when you play with jigs, there gets to be the length of the stroke and the depth of the pulse. And so you again have to match it to the deposit because you, again you're getting your lights to go on up and your heavies to go down and they go into that bedding. And they vacuum them up with a shop vac on Friday, run them through a sieve, picked out all the, the sapphires, put the bedding right back into it, they were done. 
It was one of the slickest things that I'd ever run into. And, uh, but like I said, this was a metallurgy class, uh, getting to look at, at recovering sapphires. What were we, Courtney, about 96? That is close. I think it's 94. It could be 96. Okay. So, <clears throat> like I said, jigs aren't something a lot of you get to play with, but if you're into sapphires, some of the gold deposits, it depends on what people like to play with. That's where you usually see them in the field. Now, <clears throat> Montana's got a lot of sapphires, and this was a guy that I never completely understood. Um, he was over out of Helena, and there's some high benches. So he was mining, went up through a screen deck, came down through a set of jigs in here. Um, I can't tell you what the hell that is. And when he got done, Oh, this was the beater that then came back through on your undersides for your fine gold with spirals. And the spirals then came down and the cons, because on a spiral, you'll end up with, with a band and you can set the splitter so that the gold all comes out on that. Now, a friend of mine, I'll show you a picture on it, there's a lot of variances in spirals. And so again, you have to match the deposit, or the spiral to the deposit. And he went through, I think, eight or ten different ones that had different pitches. Uh, Rick, I think you had a hell of a collection over there, Golden Sunlight, right? And uh, <clears throat> you match that to shape, velocity, specific gravity, all those, and find the one that works the best. I've, I've never got anybody to explain how to test that. Everybody I ever saw ran it through just series ones to sell what worked. And so that they can put a splitter, and this is a little Wilfley table, and so that con that came off of that went directly to the Wilfley table, and then uh, came off the end and picked out the coarse gold. The stuff that come off the table, he loaded in 55 gallon drums and took it to the smeller when the circle was operating. And <clears throat> there's nothing more exciting than watching the face of a, of a guy at the smelter <clears throat> when you deliver a big pot of iron to him. It just drives them goddamn nuts. Uh, they like gold, but they don't like iron. And be it pyrite, which came out of Diamond Hill, or magnetite, which came out of this. My experience is that pyrite and magnetite inside the matrix will hold about a half ounce per ton. But no matter how you concentrate it, 100% magnetite or 100% pyrite con, uh, that is in that will never exceed a half ounce per ton. And they like about 12 ounces of the smell. And so this was a mixture of free gold plus the magnetite. And I never never run the magnetite to know how much it held, but it is a thing. And you get people that fire us a magnetite or fire us a pyrite, God, it's a great line. And you're going, uh, uh, uh. You can't get it out by smelting. You've got to find a way to enrich that grain that they really don't want to feed it. It's just a, a real pain in the butt. This was another interesting little unit. <coughs> These were rougher jigs. Went to a cleaner jig in the middle. Came off the top. Here's a, a grizzly. And from the, the grizzly, the underflow came down through here, went to a gravel pump, went all the way to the top to a distributor. From the distributor down to these rougher jigs, then to a cleaner jig. <coughs> and they were getting sapphires. It was a pretty good operation. I showed up there one day and uh, <coughs> noticed the original design, this was a slope, and that the grizzly through here was V-shaped so that the coarse rocks would land on that, dump their load, and slide off the side. The difference between who designed it and who modified it turned this thing into a flat grizzly, as it was easier to feed, and the rocks would come off of this, and there was a lot of them, and build up a reef in front of the boat. And so then they'd have to pull the barge back and then <clears throat> get the excavator out there with a the long reach to pull all those rocks that had stacked up, 
to put on either side before they could advance the boat and continue. And I asked the guys and said, so what's the issue? And he says, I really think what it was is that the rocks on that V-shaped grizzly made so much noise going down that metal slide that there were so many complaints on night shift that uh, that's when they changed that, but it just made an ungodly mess. So back to your conditioning, what are you doing to that deposit? What does it contain? Uh, how are you gonna separate it out before you get it down to actually processing the material? God, I got a lot of sapphires in here. <clears throat> just a horrible thing. Um, these were a couple of guys that had been in Vietnam together and came back to Lewistown and they were the only operating uh, uh, Yoko Sapphire operation as a load deposit. <coughs> and you find a lot of really interesting things that people can do. And in that section of the Yogo, the deposit had had a secondary alteration and the uh, matrix that held the stones had been cooked to a mud. And initially they would blast <coughs> and then put the sample or put the rock on the road and drive on it for a couple of years. And when they got done driving on it, then they bring it back in and run it through their large plant. And uh, it would have broken down by driving on it over a couple of years so they could recover all their sapphires. And those really nice blue yogos. Uh, one of the first places that I ever found <coughs> that had an oscillating feeder came in off of the Grizzly, uh, came down here, and there was a, a toggle, and it would come back, and then this little door would go shut, and it would push it forward, and then when they pulled it back, the toggle would come up and it would go forward, and that controlled that stroke as it went back and forth with this little four-inch plate the rate at which that it went into this, this problem. Same situation we talked about. This whole section from here to here is a scrubber. But only this section here is an honest to God screen. And so you look at that and go, okay, if you're gonna do that, why don't you instead of connecting them you could <clears throat> change the angle if you put that scrubber in by putting a couple of hydraulic rams on the back side. You could flatten it, you could steepen it wherever you want. Then you really don't need a, a drum out in the end. You could feed it and get twice as much efficiency using a, a flat uh, wet screen. And you'd be able to go to a two deck screen so you didn't have to worry about blinding off all those holes because your efficiency on a trommel is probably only about 14 inches. The rest of it's up there in the air, and that portion is, is just buried. So, <clears throat> back to that point of trommels aren't the best thing, but they make pretty good scrubbers. And in all honesty, if you set them up correctly, you can probably get all the scrubbing you need to about 12 foot, and then feed them to a screen deck. And back to your conditioning, how you, you prepare this thing for recovery. Well, then it run off to here, <coughs> and there's only a couple places that I know uh, make commercial jigs, but every camp I ever worked in, in the winter, they'd weld up their own jigs and make them from scratch. I saw uh, wheelbarrow tires used as part of the bellows. I, I saw uh, a damaged collection of things. That was the winter uh, effort was, I think we can make a better jig. And I've seen them 10 foot by 10 foot, two foot by two foot, but they all recover pretty good stuff. And uh, <clears throat> they just dump the waste off of that one, you know, back to the jig bed in the middle. The underflow run into a small box down here. There wasn't much in the way of gold, some copper. And uh, the rest of this just went back into the pond. But these guys were mining a load deposit, processing with gravity techniques, and producing some of the most beautiful yoga sapphires that I ever saw. <clears throat> they had no training, no background, uh, except one of them was just a hell of a good machinist. Now up here in the highlands, this was a common plant uh, back in, 
probably 28 to about 36. And the reason it was called a Bodenson plant, and again, you're looking at a trommel through the middle of this, but they had different size holes graduated all the way through here so that uh, you could, each sluice box had a different type of ripple at the same slope, but it had, um, how the hell did that work? It started with about an eighth inch in the very first sluice, and it ended up with about two inches on the last sluice. So that I think there was, and it came out both sides. So you normally can process about uh, 15 yards of material per foot of width of box. And so <clears throat> under that, by having this, this is really set up the way a lot of the old uh, bucket line dredges were, that they'd have great big banks of sluices, and then they'd go to a common one, which everything would go out on this side. And they would come out both sides of that trommel so that you could get the maximum amount of screening and increase your yardage. But in this one, they changed the ripples due to the hole size on a graduated trauma for screening. And uh, it worked very good, and then they just didn't make them anymore after that. Quite an interesting program. This, by any chance, was up in here. <coughs> Notice how flat all of this is. And uh, they were processing a bunch of gravel. And some of these deposits can get kind of exotic. And if you go over to the museum here at Tech, they have a nugget that's about the size of a belt buckle and about a foot thick. And uh, that's where they got that at the end of the day, they were washing everything. And the nugget was up here in the, in the Grizzly. Uh, it was too big to flow anywhere. Uh, they call it what, the Centennial Nugget. I think it's in the safe when you go to the Mineral Museum. <coughs> You don't necessarily have to get really expensive things. This is a friend of mine, and this was a sapphire operation, or not a sapphire, a, a garnet operation from a <coughs> tungsten deposit. Up in here was done by General Electric through the 40s and 50s. So these guys were remining the tails down towards Dillon, and it was the first place that I I saw them, again, you've got your jigs. These came from Australia. Um, they, inside, they set up a series of, of little pumps. So it was sized to begin with. Then it came out <coughs> for their feed. They used a hydrosizer. And that gave them, rather than screens, that gave them the ability to control the size of their feed products uh, to their units. And <clears throat> their waste product was tungsten, was shelite. And so that ran across the Gemini table and went into a barrel. Then they brought that into uh, here at the end of the season of their barrels, ran it over the rare earth magnets, and got <clears throat> the uh, garnet or magnetic at high intensity. And so the shelite would go in one barrel and the garnet would go in the other barrel, and the garnet was used for water jet cutting. As a very you know, a little softer, it's one of the softer garnets, but it produced a very nice product, even cutting uh, stainless steel. Now, one of the things that gets quite intriguing is okay, you got water, water, water. <clears throat> what do you do with a sloppy, wet material? Well, you got to dry it. And so, what was in here, and they were in building it is that they had a tube inside a tube with uh, uh, propane torches. And so the garnet would come into this and it would dry it as it worked its way through that. Well, then they discovered, well, God, that's a great idea, but when it comes out the end of this, it's hot enough to light things on fire. They couldn't bag it, they couldn't put it in a bin. It's really hot stuff. So then they had to create another one that had an airflow that would cool it now that it's dry to be able to come out and then they go into here. This was, was before they set it up. And they had a vertical bin and they pneumatically put it into the bin uh, 
for the storage, and that went into a bagging unit. And then they shipped the garnet to wherever they, they needed for uh, water jet cutting. I don't know if you guys ever worked with your water jet cutting. 60 to 80 mesh. Uh, you don't lose the temper, and you can cut very, very fine cuts. They cut paper, they cut all kinds of different things, use water jet. Uh, it's a high, high pressure, uh, small substance, and the abrasiveness will cut a very polished cut. Uh, quite interesting to, to work with, but you're back to the point in industrial minerals of how far can you actually ship it. And every good mining operation needs a scam. <clears throat> and I would end up on these things, oh, I don't know, once every two or three years. This was a little operation. They had some interesting units here. Uh, that were kind of oscillating fish scales. And as the material came out, it would go down these things and they were supposed to separate out the gold. A great operation. Um, the intriguing part was here's the tailings pond. Uh, they didn't want to spend the money on the surveyor and the Forest Service boundary was about here so they built a million and a half dollar facility on the Forest Service ground without a permit. And uh, the boys in green had an absolute fit over the whole program. It was at least six, seven months worth of entertainment before everybody got out of court. So I ended up bringing <coughs> my class that I had out of uh, Phoenix uh, for the National Training Center. And I said, OK, let's do material balances all the way through here. You know, the rock goes in here, and it comes out here, and it goes to here, and it goes out here, and they go, well, wait a second. I said, what'd you find? And they said, well, at the head of this whole mess is a trowel, and it's only three feet in diameter. And for three feet in diameter, there's only 14 inches of screen that it can actually screen. So you have a 2,000 yard per hour uh, recovery plant, but your treatment plant for running it through in this trommel is about uh, three yards per hour. So how does that work? And I said, well, you guys missed the big point. And they said, well, what's that? And I said, did you notice the little sluice box hidden underneath the trommel? So all the gold come out of that little four foot sluice box underneath the trommel, and most of the waste went through this unit. Um, <clears throat> that one, I think, only took two years to go through the courts as a scam. The guy will call me up one day and he says, can I talk to you about that stuff up there? And I went, sure. He said, <clears throat> I'd like to know what, how much money I'm going to make. Okay. Then I looked at it. Uh, the valley's 300 feet wide. I doubt if the Pink Street runs that far, but the valley's 300 feet wide. You, Probably ought to guess that half of that may run. But, but let's say three, 300 feet wide. And I said, what they told me when they put up the big meal, uh, bought food, brought in caterers, all the different stuff, it said it ran about $25 a yard. OK. So I figured the width and the length and the depth and the cost and put it together. And I said, well. Under assumptions, this should make right around $100,000 net. And he says, how can that be? And I said, what do you mean, how can that be? And he says, we spent $19 million on the large plant. If it's only got $100,000 worth of gold on it, how the hell are we going to come out on that? I said, damned if I know, but I guess you can guess why I'm not an investor. <coughs> I got drug into a number of court cases. Um, this is another one of my guys that uh, <clears throat> was an interesting duck. And again, didn't there are a lot of egos in small miners, and they know all the answers. You can't help. Have you guys ever seen a gold wheel? Gold okay. wheel? Hmm? A gold wheel? Yeah, like a genie. Well, this one is a four-foot diameter genie. 
And the overflow, of, you know, it comes up through the middle, I'll explain that in the middle, that goes to a regular genie, and then that goes to a little sluice box. And up here was a jig. So you had uh, a screening assembly off a trommel going to the top of a jig, but then <clears throat> the underflow fed to this gold wheel, which fed to another gold wheel, which then fed to a sluice box. Okay? All make sense? Kind of weird? <clears throat> a gold wheel has a spiral, and it's cast into it with rubber, and <clears throat> you can change the pitch on this thing, and they're quite interesting. They move very slowly, and you can dial this thing in, flatten it out, and <clears throat> watch the gold go right up this ramp and into the hole in the back. And the big gold goes up really quick. And then you'll dial a little more, a little more, and you'll reach a point where the gold particles are starting to match the black sand particles. And at that point, <clears throat> you can't get separation anymore. And it's normally, yeah, probably something in that realm of around 10 to 20 mesh. And it's just not effective anymore. Now, I've used them uh, as an amalgamator you change the battery, put some mercury in the bottom, run them in reverse, and it'll sit there and, and move the, the, gold, the mercury and the gold until it comes out as a little amalgamation uh, glob. Then put it back the right direction, and that glob of gold will then go up and go directly into the back. It's really kind of neat. Uh, that's how we ran a lot of our samples. <clears throat> so the day we show up here, <clears throat> we went down and looked in the back, and we looked at the other one, and we looked really hard and discovered that uh, the jig was plugged. And they hadn't had anything that it was picking up for the better part of five days. Uh, it was just the whole bed. You know, you can you get into a jig and you can run your hand out there and you'll feel the pulse. And when the, when the hutch is completely full or whatever, there is no pulse. And there is no gold being recovered. You just Orch and gravel. So it's, it's a, an interesting game. But that's what the wheels do, is these little spiral things. And they'll recover gold very easily in coarser particles. Uh, so you screen, we screen off the big gold, run the mid size through the uh, uh, wheel. <coughs> and then the really fine gold, you'd have to come up with another technique on that one. This is a little mill down out of Sheridan. And they were processing hard rock. So you've got the mill back in here. And then this goes up to a, uh, a cyclone. A cyclone to get your pulp density. I prefer a hindered settling cone. A hindered settling cone is, is like a funnel, but you get water flowing up. And with the water flowing up, you get stratification. So your, your heavier particles will be in the bottom. And then when you dial the water inflow down, then you'll feed it into your feeder box, and that will control your pulp density on how that comes across on the table. <clears throat> when this is set up correctly, you'll find that your gold, and you can see a faint hit on this, the gold, uh, bigger pieces will be clean up here on the top. You'll get black sand. This material through here is largely waste and it goes over the edge. And a lot of these, if they're set up correctly, you'll have a couple of, of course tables and then a finishing table that'll follow that. And your finishing, your course table, you can set a splitter and pull the gold directly. The finishing table typically is set a little flatter. It'll be instead of a 15-foot table, it'll only be a 7-foot table, and you run your middlings off of that so you can dial it in. And they, they, they can work out good. But your size, you have to remember, is that <clears throat> 10, to 15, 10 to 14 mesh um, is the lower end on most tables, 30 mesh on the upper end. They make a slimes table. I've never seen one operate. They do from uh, about 30 mesh to 60 mesh. And anything finer than that, it just goes out. And so they were running tables here in Butte, jigs and tables on copper ore up until uh, flotation wasn't developed until 28, wasn't used till 33 or 35. They mined 80% of the high-grade 
sulfide deposits in Butte before they could recover it. So they were getting 45% recovery on 55% copper. And <clears throat> the rest of it went down the creek. So what was, what we uh, look at as a mistake is called Superfund. So you got to pay for it and pay for it and pay for it, and then they buried it. Uh, so it's, it's back to knowing what these things will actually do. <clears throat> now here's two of them side by side, in that here is a Wilfley table, and you can see the band right through here. So this portion on this edge it is about a half inch, and that's your goal. They would have flattened that table a little bit, you could have separated that gold out here, and it would have been a lot easier to split. Then the middlings here is the portion that you then bring over here, and they're feeding it. If I can get this here, they're feeding it with a teaspoon. Uh, you can feed that with a hindered settling cone. The difference is in a Wilfley table, you have uh, little spines and the gold hooks behind that. When you get to a Gemini table, number one, these are a real pain in the butt. Uh, you have to adjust the water for every one of these spigots, and they plug. So you've got to have on a Gemini table a filter so you can control that water or those spigots, and if it dries, then the table will, will be uh, hydrophobic and the stuff won't flow, and if you get too much water, it'll flow it through. So there's quite a bit of adjustment. But the key to it, instead of, <coughs> of uh, ripples or that stick up, these are grooves. And as this material comes out, the black sand goes down this way, and the gold goes up each one of these grooves, and it'll work all the way down. And it'll eventually hook on to these, see how each one of these is hooked into that. And this will go off the end of the table into a <coughs> small bucket. And when they're really working correctly, it'll look just like, like blood except it's solid gold. Go right down those grooves and filling in at the end. And your range on this material is, uh, oh, Probably maybe 30 mesh, but it's really in that 200 mesh range for, for getting separation on the fines. And they work quite well. And there's a number of different variances on them. But again, and I'll show you a different one, a teaspoon is really a crappy thing to feed the Gemini table with. <clears throat> it takes a lot of patience for a lot of beer. One of the two. Okay, this is a mill over here at Peabird. They come off the mill, and this is a Nelson concentrator right here. And the Nelson concentrator then pumped up here to a hindered settling cone. Okay, and you got un up, upwelling water inside that cone. One of the Nelsons and Falcons, two different size ranges, but they're a centrifugal bowl when they spin. So you're taking that specific gravity of the gold and you're increasing uh, with gravity that weight by spinning it. And then they shut down and automatically clean and pump up to the top and then they turn back on. So one of their biggest things is they fill and then they drain and then they fill and drain and you have to set them up. <coughs> um, if you look at the next one, well, their, their waste product that come off of the Nelson then went to the float cells. And all the, their waste product, they would run through flotation. And the coarse gold went into the cone, which is right here. See the pump set up in the bottom. And then that they could dial that in, and that would feed down here. And <clears throat> it would run out, and it literally just little buckets of gold come out the end of that thing and went right into the safe. They didn't have to dry it or anything else, but you're dealing with small particles. The ore that they were in was 54 ounces per ton. This was the Bruce Jack mine in British Columbia. <coughs> and you can see again, here's your little adjustments all the way up here to try to get an even flow of water 
comes all the way through there. And then the gold comes right down these grooves. And this is the black sand coming off the edge. But uh, I ran one out of gold creek for a while, and we did pretty good. We had to pull the coarse gold out first, and then we take the fine gold and black sand and use this to clean, clean up the black sand and fine gold. My early days, we just amalgamated. And you learned all kinds of tricks. I can tell you things about, <coughs> about mercury that you'll never believe. Um, okay, one last operation, if I remember right. <coughs> this was an operation out of Fairbanks, Alaska, that the bucket line bridges used to run. So, because they mined the upper stuff, this was pre-stripped with a drag line. Then they mined this material and trucked it over and put it in this pile. Classic Alaska. You have a wonderful excavator that just sits here and feeds the uh, uh, trunk. <coughs> Your oversize comes up the end, runs up to the oversized stacker and dumps on the ground and backfills the pit that they were just in. The rest of it was again starting to see uh, Watch the jiggies. Gravel pumps. And they were big. The stuff that, that I saw in some of the aggregate operations in uh, southeast United States for gravel with cutter head dredges, they were using up to three foot diameter gravel pumps and, and pumping this stuff half a mile inside the valley. <clears throat> so then this was all invented by guys. And you see the polyline coming into it. Uh, they pumped it up to the top. Inside, for automatic leveling, when they moved it, these were D9 uh, blade pistons. And they could uh, move this thing and set up with hydraulics and a motor that was on it and level that entire plant in probably less than 15 minutes. And it was a pretty good sized plant. The lower end had jigs. That was their final recovery. The sand screws took it up here and put that on a uh, belt. And inside here, <coughs> they had a distributor and then four two-foot sluice boxes. And a little thick. You got to deal, remember, you're dealing with specific gravity of water. And if your water isn't, uh, it, when it starts to get thick, it doesn't pick up stuff. So you want to be able to keep your, your water to solids ratio under control or you end up just pumping blood. And <clears throat> everything came out of this and the pond that they just dug, they backfilled and so it was continuous. And these, these pits were 1,500 feet long and they would backfill one while they were digging the next one and just continuously being mining and reclaiming. Uh, I think it was a old man and four, four boys. And they were running that thing for the hell of an operation. So, questions? Yes, sir. Uh, in your experience, about what's the smallest particle size gold that's readily gravity recoverable? I think I've seen stuff that was in that 400 mesh range. Uh, in, one, in a falcon separator that the guys were able to pull off. They told me one the other day that was in Wyoming, they were currently operating, that they couldn't separate it with a falcon and the gold was so fine that it was staying in suspension in the water. And I said, well, what do you do with that? And he said, uh, it's staying in suspension, so we filtered it. And we were getting economic values in uh, pulling it out of the water with filters and we're making money at that point. So, so you're back to the point of, of what is it, match it up with the first batch we saw, of, of what kind of tools do we have available for that size range, and you really want to be someplace in the middle of that particular uh, instrument for a size range. And then, as Bob told me on a lot of his stuff, you have to watch very closely on your water pressure in a lot of these, both Nelson and and in the uh, uh, Falcon, water pressure makes a really big difference. And so having good gauges on that and being able to run that recovery can be quite a bit of difference. But you can recover. I've seen guys that said, 
we're going to recover to 1,500 mesh. 1,500 mesh is when you start shooting particles against particles uh, with high pressure. Um, back to your economics. Can you really make money at that? <coughs> Anybody else? Gordon, you to do better this time? You can go all week. <laughs> <laughs> um, so for this one, so for this particular uh, email that you have, uh, what do they use as lining for those uh, just straight boxes? Just straight steel. So most of that was probably, oh, I'd say 3 sixteenths. And periodically they would, uh, as they would wear through, they'd patch them for a while and then they'd just build a whole new set and put them in. But uh, the biggest thing is since you were already uh, run it through the screen. The gold in Alaska, for the most part, was very, very fine. And so their particles of what they were pumping, instead of two-inch rock like what you see in Montana, a lot of their stuff is probably a coarse sand, maybe maybe quarter-inch at best, and, and going from there. Remember, in all the deposits in Alaska, there was only three of them that were star and hoster that had big gold. And all the rest of them were really more from, from a gold porphyry. And so it was a little micro particles that were mixed in with the, the uh, other rocks and that stuff so they could screen it fairly easy. And I didn't see a huge amount of clay up there either. It wasn't that alteration that we normally encounter. So the condition wasn't so hard. So uh, I'm just curious because I'm back in Africa. I'm from Ghana, West Africa. Right. And we uh, do a lot of small scale mining down there. And um, when we do, when we have a smooth box like this, we normally line it out, even though we we'll have those uh, sort of riffles in it, mm -hmm. those bars that will space out to uh, a foot or two foot, depending on how you want to do it. When we do that, we usually line it with a, a copper material, just so it, uh, that also is able to capture the flow. But it's, it's, it, it sort of inhibits the flow. Right. Of the gold because yeah. when you use it, now most the arm picking it might just run down uh, depending on how this costs the water. In in the stuff that over the years, um, one that worked was floor tread uh, that has a, a little eight inch high rib uh, and that was you know you used to be able to cut and put it in there. A common one now is they have what they call miner's moss that's about three eighths of an inch thick. It's a weave. And it does fairly good on that. The most bizarre one I run into was one of my old compatriots from the Bureau of Mines. And he says, well, you don't need to do that. And I said, OK, so what do you do? And he pulled out a series of magnets. And it was a, was a, uh, a magnetite deposit, a, a plaster with a lot of magnetite. And he put a series of magnets all the way up the bottom of the box, and the magnetite would stick up and make magnetite riffles. And the fine gold would catch into that. And <clears throat> then they'd clean, they'd pull the magnets off, wash it out, the box run through a Gemini table, get recovered. And it was sort of like, wow, that works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, know. I hit one the other day, and I haven't figured it out yet. I've got a dep uh, deposit I've been working on over out of Superior. Doesn't have any magnetite. The gold runs 960 to 985, but it, it has specular hematite. And so it has black sand that's not magnetic. And so I've got a little vial that's about 50, 60 percent gold and all this miserable black crud, and I'm going to see Okay, how am I going to separate this stuff? And other one, I worked in the dome lands in California, and instead of magnetite, it had ilmenite. And the Elkhorns here in Montana also have high ilmenite. It's magnetically induced. And my gut hunch, and maybe even on the, the uh, stuff that I've got, I'd have to bring it in and try it. Uh, but it could be the answer is rare earth magnets. And it's not obviously magnetic. But with the right thing, you may magnetically induce it and get the separation out that way. So it's, it's experimentation. You have to see kind of how it works. But yeah, I worked with a bunch of guys that were, were into some of that stuff and gone. And the hassle with it is it's sacrilytic. 
Uh, equatorial stuff, even California has a lot of that. And you may find the alteration of the feldspars and stuff down 250 feet. And so it's gooey, it's gummy, uh, it really doesn't want to come apart. Then you're back to that point, you might want to excavate it, let it sit uh, so that it starts to slack and then feed it through so that it'll start to separate the bay wash. But it'll take a little bit to figure out how to get to do that. When you say slack, I presume it, it changes it in a particular manner, but can you define that more precisely when you mean uh, slacking the clay? What, what it, happens? It's a, a process of oxygenation. And <clears throat> you put it out like a cut, mine it in the fall. It's a sunk cost in the fall of mining it and stacking it. And over the winter, there'll be enough oxidation inside that clay that when you come back in the spring and wash it, it won't have that, that uh, sticky texture to it, and it'll wash clean. And so uh, it's just a, a thing that clay does. If you get oxygen to it underground, you'll find the same thing. You'll be mining underground, and <clears throat> if it is exposed to air, especially here in Butte, it'll go from rock to clay in about four days. And then from clay to that nasty, gummy, cohesive stuff into to spalling and falling apart. Sometimes that takes a month or two. Same thing in, in the guys that were working there in uh, Yogo, is that they had <coughs> uh, the matrix inside that material had been altered, so it was nasty, gummy, almost rock. But by six months or seven on the road, it would start to alter it with that oxygen and so that it would go from clay into silt and then you could wash it fairly easily. And so if you got really gummy stuff, pull it out, stack it up, let it over winter, come back in the spring and wash it. Sometimes that helps where you're dealing with both temperature and you're dealing with lack of water in the latter part of the season. So you can mine easily in things that you would be drowning at if you were there earlier in the year come back in the spring when you have lots of water and process it at that time. Uh, I've, I've, the only thing you have to watch is the guys with the metal detectors, because if it's got a lot of coarse gold, you might get a pretty well scalp before you want to do that just before it freezes solid. <laughs> then you have a fighting chance. But yeah, that's the, the clay will degrade in from a, a gummy clay. It depends on the type of clay but it'll degrade from a gummy clay into a, a, a silt-like material, just very fine. And how? Oh, more. Um, when you're getting a lot of sliming in your process water, increasing the viscosity as you were talking about, what's the, I mean, of course, a big reservoir to allow settling is one potential solution, but is there any other kind of standard tools for that? situation? You know, we had some of that in the stuff we were in dry cotton with. And what you'll find is there's a carrying capacity uh, in most of these tailings ponds, meaning that a certain portion of it will settle out, uh, usually fairly early on. And when I'm usually working those, you'll bring up a, a jug, uh, take a bunch of your water, muddy water, set it down, mark it, and calculate your settling what that does because you're going to recycle your water is you need to be able to say okay it's going to take two and a half hours well I often would run into the guys and they'd say uh, <clears throat> we we're going to run 24 hours a day and I went no you're not look at the settling rate within your clay and then look at the retention that goes with that because you may find that <clears throat> at the beginning of the season you have a little silty water, but by July, you're starting to get thick water. And by August, this stuff is staying in suspension and you're having a real problem. Now, techniques that I've seen you know, with the pond, when you develop thick water, then you can use a vegetative filter. So you pump out your pond into a grassy meadow and let that clay and silt that's in that water settle out and refill it with clean water. You can use, um, God, I can't think of the name of it. They cost about $100,000 and, and essentially you add, there's some uh, materials they have that will agglomerate all that clay and make it come out. 
uh, uh, clarifier. And I've seen them in the sand and gravel operations in California. They had one up here. Oh, uh, they brought it in on one of the things that I had on, on that one. I showed you the, the first plant that had about four different steps in it. And I said, uh, it won't work. You don't have the water. And they did. They, they got into it and they were going to add that stuff to it and pull out all the clay and no, they didn't have enough water. And you'll still lose 20 to 28 percent of your water in your pond will be tied up inside uh, the matrix of the sediment that you've got in your pond. So it turned into a gooey, rotten thing. Uh, th those guys got into a technique <coughs> that when they would completely backfill a section and they were filling up the pond, the last thing they would do was pump all that muddy water out of the pond out there in the middle of their reclaim and let all the sod and different pieces they had after they had uh, uh, seeded it, would pump it out and use a vegetative filter to pull it out and then put fresh water into the pond. So they recycle about every month. They recycle their entire water. Second choice is you're looking at more retention time for your water. So you, you'll have a uh, sediment pond and have that run to a sediment pond so that your coarse fraction comes out of the first set of the pond, and then it goes to the second one, and that retention time out of that will then give it what you need. But you need to know what your settling rate and what your retention with, of the material and the type of clay that's in there. Um, back to the point, attention to detail. Uh, and so oftentimes the guys say, we're gonna run 24 hours a day, and I said, no, your water's gonna tell you what you're gonna run. <laughs> And oftentimes you'll find in a lot of these near source stub, uh, zones that have a lot of alteration, I would guess gone as well into that, that you run three or four days and then you go do something, you strip, you do something, but you let that water settle out. The other thing we got into in, in one of the other books that I wrote, we went, it's the, uh, in sediment ponds, <clears throat> it's the distance of travel because you have a rate at which those particles will fall out. And so if you can make that pond quite long, then you will eventually, so that the coarse comes out in the first third, the medium comes out in the middle third, and when you get to the last piece, then you're, you're down to that really fine clay uh, section. The first portion, you can clean the pond every month or so because it's the coarse fraction. And so in order to get to do that, if you look at most ponds people put in, they're big circular ponds. The failure in circular ponds is that you have a settling zone on the outside edges, but you have a curve down through the middle going to the discharge point. And so only about a third of your pond actually settles. If you go to a U-shaped pond, you have a, a portion in the middle so that you can run an excavator down there and pull your mud out uh, so you can clean it easier. But half of that pond is a backwater. And so you discharge into your pond at this end and when it makes that big U, then you pull that water back out. It's a shorter distance to pump. It has a longer distance. You don't need volume, you need distance. And uh, everyone that I got the guys to do that uh, found that a, oh, probably 150, 80 to 100 yards per hour of operation, the actual pond was about a quarter of an acre. And that uh, they were getting uh, 80, 90 percent settling in that quarter of an acre in a U shaped pond. Uh, and there's a design and all the calculations, again, at the Bureau of Mines uh, under best management practices, placer mining best management practices. And uh, all the formulas are in the middle of it, how to calculate it and how to dig them and how to put them in place. It's a, it's a horrible publication. I think it's uh, 25 pages and they charge $2.20. <laughs> so that help? Yes. Uh, any other questions? More cred than you ever wanted to know. I, I reach that point that it sort of bubbles out of my brain. <laughs> <laughs> Anything on uh, 
online books. I tried to cover everything, uh, everything we had in questions. If you've got any on your questions, throw them at me and I'll tell you. Nothing from the questions from for you, but uh, I just wanted to say thanks for coming to present today and also recognize and appreciate the fact that you work for the Bureau of Mines. I think I know of few others on tech campus that work for Bureau of Mines um, and uh, it's not it's not a common thing and I guess I am curious on your opinion of whether there's a place for an agency like the Bureau of Mines to fill in the U.S. and if you have any hope that one day it will return to to fill that that role again or or if you think it's a thing of the past. I would, would hope so. You know, it's been a political mistake that they put together. And one on campus here at Keck was Tom Cam and I went to school together in Idaho. And then both worked at that uh, Western Field Operations Center in Spokane. Uh, Tom did most of the costing stuff and I did uh, mostly wilderness work and then environmental work. And, we had a facility in Albany, Oregon that was dedicated just to working out metallurgy uh, on difficult deposits on how to get separation and, and uh, you know, help the companies with that. And I think the reason it got butchered was because it was one of the only agencies that, honest to God, uh, did the research and, and helped the mining industry uh, to work better, make more money, be more efficient. And, and then under the Clinton administration, they decided that they needed to be punished. I don't know. We have Forest Service uh, that's there that's supposed to be to manage the trees. You have each one of these agencies, and the Bureau of Mines, I think when I left, we were down to 2,500 people na nationwide uh, in centers in Reno, uh, Salt Lake City, Albany, Spokane, Denver. Pittsburgh, and I think there was a couple others. And uh, it, it, all the people I worked with were really top-notch and had huge amounts of experience. And some of the publications that are out there and the information cir circulars and reported investigations are invaluable for the quality of work that came out. I'm 70. I don't know if they will get smart. Uh, I've always wanted to put on my email uh, just a, a little statement at the bottom that said that <clears throat> if the answer was the government, the question was really stupid. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, I would hope they would do something, but I doubt if I'll see it in my lifetime. Most of my compadres that are in Spokane are dying off one or two a year. Uh, and I've got a few others that I still uh, confer with that are scattered across the country. But we really had, in Spokane, we had 205 geologists and mining engineers, and we covered uh, the seven or the six western states. They never would send me to Hawaii, but I tried really hard. <laughs> <laughs> I kept telling them those placer bills that need to be looked at. And they never could quite swallow that, but I tried. That help? Yeah, well, thank for that. Yeah, I appreciate that. It seems like most of our peers internationally have a uh, have an agency that's an analog to the Bureau of Mines, and it seems like you know it's a direct um, link for industry to the federal government that that we are lacking. So I hope you're right that you know there's a place for it in in the future. But uh, just, just remember, yeah, thanks again for your time. When it comes to government, you can't fix stupid. <laughs> We, we were the only light that I could ever see that no, served like people. Four, one, and, uh, right I spent most of my life someplace in government doing those kinds of things. But I appreciate you, you remembering that uh, we did exist and we did things, and it, it, it's something that we need to get. It was always intriguing when the industry would go down. One of the places was that the guys would leave industry and go work in the bureau lines for five or six, and sometimes a career, but they, 
that interchange of the technology and the understanding from industry, then going over to the bureau lines for research, and then bringing that information back to industry, I think was invaluable. And now we're underfunding our universities, we're uh, punishing anybody that gets a degree in a lot of these fields when we should be looking at how can we mine it more efficiently, how can we reclaim it better than we ever did before, what are all the different uses that we can do with some of these elements? God only knows. i give you one shot you get a kick out of it. Is that my barber one day came in and, <clears throat> and I was running a wealthy table and he said, could you pull the gold out of this for me? And I said, sure. Set it up on the table, it's a gallon jug, and the gold came out of the wealthy table just like a hill. But on the top of the ripples, there was a two-inch band of kind of a lime green sand. And we looked at that for the longest time and went, what the hell is that? It was heavier than black sand, it was a little lighter than garnet. And so we put it in the jug and set it up on the shelf. And every once in a while, we, well, does it fluoresce? No, nope, it didn't fluoresce. We went through each test we could dream of, and we looked at that stuff. And finally one day, we were doing some testing, and I pulled out a cinnamometer, and I happened to be over next to that little jug, and I turned it on, and it goes, and we're going, holy crap, what's that? And so we walked out into the hallway, and it goes, Dink. it just sits there and stares at us. And we're going, hell. Walk back into the room, and it goes, and drives nuts. And so we sat down with the mineralogy book. The stuff was yttrium. And when you deal in the Idaho bathlet, it's a rare earth metal filled full of thorium, and our lab had been radioactive for <laughs> six months. <laughs> so now as we look on, oh my god, we need rare earths. we got to have lithium batteries. <clears throat> Who out there found where these resources were? and how you use them, it was the Bureau of Mines. Then it was that funding Bureau of Mines, then to the universities for the research projects and the grad students, and the combination got us where the hell we are. I don't know if we'll ever see that, but by God we should. But remember, when you see a lot of lime green sand, don't sleep in it. <laughs> <laughs>